morning. If you would, join with, we, with me in prayer this morning. Father God, you alone are glorious. Jesus, you are beautiful. You are all-powerful. You are holy. You are righteous. You are a counselor. You are a healer. You are a provider. You are a prince of peace. And you are king of kings. This morning, we want to see nothing but you. God, I pray as we open up your word, that your spirit would teach us, that it would open our eyes to see your words fresh, that we would have ears that hear, but not only hear, but they understand, and then we'll apply your word to our lives. But God, most importantly, we are in desperate need of your grace to change our hearts, to change our attitudes, and to change our minds. Do that this morning as we examine your word. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, Hollywood Community Church. We are continuing our series titled Flipped. And the last couple weeks, we've looked at some amazing truths, but we've looked at them in a new way, where Jesus takes an old concept, flips it upside down, and says, no, 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 this is the way the world really works. And God, and, and Pastor Brian has shown us with the first week of where the poor in spirit... What poor in spirit means is we recognize our sinfulness, our depravity, and realize that we can do nothing about it, and we fall at the mercy of God's feet. Then we learned last week where Pastor Brian beautifully uh, displayed to us that mourning is a, it's a mourning over sin. It's not talking just about being sad, and that as we mourn over our sin, God will grant us forgiveness. And this morning, we're going to unpack Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. So if you have your Bible, I would invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5 as we open it up. And as you're getting there, I have a question for you in here. How many of you in here love fairy tales? Anyone in here love fairy tales? Okay, a few of you. Who hates fairy tales? Anybody hate them? Okay, there's some people that hate them. Okay, I get it. I understand it. Now, don't judge me. But I do love fairy tales, okay? Don't judge me, all right? Now, there's, there's something that feels so good about these stories where you see people suffering injustice, then you see how their lives that were so wrong eventually get turned into a life that is so completely right. And so I just want to share a couple of my favorites. How many Cinderella fans are in the house this morning? Okay, good, there's a few of you. Now, how many of you wish that you could grow up to be Cinderella? Oh, just a few, just a handful. Yep, glory, she does. You, you like, okay, so. Now, here's what I love about this story. This poor girl had the worst life ever. She had an evil stepmom, and not only that, she had evil stepsisters. And she always had to do the worst work in the house. She had to wear raggedy clothes. She had to scrub floors, clean everything. They would yell at her, you know, make fun of her, all these things. And all she wanted to do, I mean, she had hopes, she had dreams, but she never got to live them because she was tied up in a house by her evil stepmom. And as you know, the story goes on that this fairy godmother came to her and said, I'm going to change your raggedy clothes into good clothes. So poof, she changes her clothes and says, I want you to go to the ball and have a great time, but just make sure you're back by midnight or your good fancy clothes are going to turn raggedy. So you got, you got to be back by midnight. So she goes to the ball and while she's there, she meets her Prince Charming. And as, when they see each other for the first time, they lock eyes and they knew that it was love at first sight. One of these moments. <laughs> and they knew we're meant to be. And she got so enamored with him that she lost track of time and she hears the clock ring and she realizes, oh no, my carriage is about to turn into a pumpkin. My clothes are going to turn raggedy and that would be a wardrobe fail. I got to get out of here. So she runs away and she leaves one of her glass slippers. Now, not only did the girl have to do hard work, but the fairy godmother gave her glass slippers like what if that breaks? She's going to cut her foot up. But anyways, that's just a side story. But she leaves her glass slippers and she runs away. The prince sees the glass slipper and he's like, man, I got to find who owns this shoe. I have to marry this girl. Then he searches all over the world for this, this amazing woman, finally finds her, and it turns out to be the foot that fits the slipper is Cinderella. They marry, and guess what? what do they, they live what? What do they live? 
happily ever after. Isn't that such a great story? Now, here's another one. I, this other one is going to seem kind of weird, but I, I, you'll see why I get it. Um, Snow White, okay? I love Snow White. Now, there's, she's got an evil stepmom, too. She's in the same position, that evil stepmom. The mom looks in the mirror every day, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of them all? Well, of course, the mirror said, well, you are. And she's like, oh, that feels good. But one day, that mirror said, uh, not you, but this lady Snow White. So she got all kind of crazy, wanted to smash the mirror. She realizes, you know what? I'm going to kick Snow White. I'm going to banish her to the forest, and then I'm going to kill her. So she tries to find a way. How can I take out Snow White? Snow White wanders through the forest, comes upon the seven drawers house, makes an agreement to stay with them, and then she made the, ba- she made the mistake one day that she decided she was going to go vegan and organic and decided to go out into the forest. Now, I have to live the life of organic things because I got a lot of stomach problems, and so I get her pain of being organic and only being able to eat apples. So she goes out there. She's hungry because she's not eating well. She's starving, and she finds this little old lady would you like to eat an apple? And of course, she's like, you know what? I'm making healthy choices. I'm watching my weight. I got to make sure I get married one day. So I'm going to take a bite of the apple. She takes a bite of the apple. Poof! She turns into a coma. And then guess what? The only thing that can awake her from her coma is a kiss from her Prince Charming. Well, sure enough, as you look at the story, Prince Charming comes along, comes up to her how beautiful she is, plants the kiss on her lips. She awakens. Oh! She comes back to life, they marry each other, and guess what? They live happily ever after. Man, I I love those stories because they they end happily ever after. And you might be saying, Brad, why are you talking about fairy tales when we're looking at Sermon on the Mount? What does this have to do with anything that we were talking about this morning? But I promise you it ties in because here's what we have. Uh, There's an incorrect view in Christianity today that is being preached all over the country and all over the world that tells, that sets Christians up for failure, disappointment, and dissatisfaction in Christ. And it is the idea that when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that you will presently live happily ever after without any struggles. The idea is that you will never face oppression You will never face persecution. You will never face want in this world. And when you come to Christ, you will finally have all the happiness that you will have in life. There's a phrase, you can have your best life now. But all of us who are Christians understand and know immediately, those of us in here that are breathing and alive, know that that is not how the world works. That God is not a genie, and when you place your faith in him, your life gets happily ever after. He does not just heap blessing and blessing and blessing upon our life where we experience all this material wealth and prosperity and fun and its happiness, and I'm going to have a big car and a big mansion. That's not what Christianity and what Jesus Christ is all about. Because you see, our best life is not now. Our best life is yet to come. So this church, this morning, we're going to allow God's Word to paint a picture of what it means for us to be meek. This morning's text is Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, and it says this, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. For us to understand this text, we have to understand what the word meek means. And I have to admit, when I first read this verse and began to study it, I had the the simple definition in mind for meek. My first thought was, well, I've heard many sermons and pastors say, to be meek means to be humble. So I just need to be humble, and then I'm going to inherit the earth. And and as I began to, to study it, and I remember what Pastor Brian has taught us the last two weeks about poor in spirit and mourning, is that it's never this very simple understanding. We have to unpack it, dig into God's Word to discover the meaning because the word meek is way more than just being humble and under God's control. That there's a whole meaning behind why Jesus was saying this word meek right here. So I had questions right away when I began to study this text. Here's some of the questions I have. What does it mean to be meek? Why is meek an important characteristic of God's people? And also, why does Jesus say the reward for being meek 
is that they will inherit the earth. Why would that be the reward if it just meant be humble? Why would the humble get the earth? It doesn't really make sense if your only understanding is humble. And so as I wrestle with these, I prayerfully and carefully begin to study this text and unwrap it. And this morning, what I would like to do is to invite you, if I could, into the process because the role of a pastor is is to teach, it's to admonish, but more than that, it's also to prepare you for you to dig into God's Word on your own, for you to learn what what it is to walk through a text and get to the real meaning of God's Word. And so this morning, I'd like to invite you into that process where together we walk through this Word so you can learn how to dive. Are you guys with me? Is that cool with you this morning? So we're going to be using our Bibles this morning. We're going to have to dig in. We're going to flip to different places in the Bible. And so follow along. And this is a great example for us, for me, and for you as well to learn how we can unpack meaning in God's Word. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to save that spot in Matthew chapter 5, but I want you to turn to Isaiah 61. We're going to start with Isaiah 61. To understand this text on the Sermon on the Mount, we must remember Jesus' mission. Because remember, Jesus is the one speaking the Sermon on the Mount. And he came to this earth for a reason. And for, to understand meek, we must understand Jesus' mission. In Isaiah 61, 1, this is what the word says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Does that word poor look familiar? Look what it says. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. Catch this. To comfort all who mourn to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. At first you might sit back and you say, okay, Brad, we're in the Old Testament now. How can this be Jesus' mission? How do you know that this is Jesus' mission? This is the Old Testament, Brad. Well, if, don't, you don't have to turn there, but you can jot this reference down. If you look at Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, Jesus reads verses from this very passage that we just read. And then he makes this statement, Today, this passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus said himself, this was his mission His mission was to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to set prisoners free, and to comfort those who mourn. You see, if you look at the words poor and comfort from Isaiah, you understand that those words are also found in the very first two Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. That Jesus' mission came to provide words of encouragement and comfort to those that are poor and those that mourn over their sin. His words are meant as an encouragement to God's people that are already living out these principles. Because sometimes we get the understanding that the Sermon on the Mount is a code of conduct where it's, okay, it says poor in spirit, so you better this week go be poor in spirit. Now, the next time you're sad and you sin, you better mourn for your sin. Go out and do these. And all we see the Sermon on the Mount is a list of do's and don'ts. And when you look at the Sermon on the Mount as a list of do's and don'ts, you quit and you give up because that's not the way it was meant to be. That's not what Jesus is doing. What Jesus is saying is this. Here's comforting words. Look at this. When you are poor in spirit, understand the kingdom of heaven is yours. When you are mourning over your sin, comfort is coming to you. When you are meek, don't worry. You will inherit the earth. You see, Jesus is providing words of comfort to us. And here we have to understand his, thing, his, his mission. It's, this is not a code of conduct. 
What the Sermon on the Mount is, is these are characteristics that God's people are already displaying. N.T. Wright, an amazing biblical scholar, rightly states, People often say what wonderful teaching the Sermon on the Mount is, and that if only people would obey it, the world would be a better place. But if we think of Jesus simply sitting there telling people how to behave properly, we will miss what was really going on. These blessings, the wonderful news that he's announcing, are not saying, try hard to live like this. They are saying that people who already are like that are in good shape. They should be happy and, and celebrate. We have to understand what was going on in Jesus' world when he, makes, when he teaches a Sermon on the Mount. The Jews were living under the Roman oppression. They were persecuted. They were in want. Think about it. The Jews did not have a land of their own. They were always in want, always in need. They were being persecuted for their faith. And here Jesus is staring in there, looking at all of his disciples who gave up everything to follow him. They said, we're going to take up our cross and follow you, Jesus. And he looks at them and provides these words of comfort to those who were suffering. He wants them to know that they have a reason for hope and joy in this world. It is with this mission in mind that we approach Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, where it says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So what does it mean to be weak, to be meek? Uh, first thing you notice, I have that question there. I say, what does it mean to be, to be meek? Many of us have the modern view of this word in mind. If you look up uh, meek in the dictionary, here's what you'll find. Timid, tame, bland, mild, humble. And many of us, if we just stop with the English word, the English word and just think, okay, all we have to do is just be mild-mannered and humble, we totally miss the meaning of this passage. It has to go beyond the word just being humble. The, this word has caused much confusion in Christian circles. There's a biblical scholar, a theologian, William Barclay, who had, who had this to say about this word meek. The meekness is the most untranslatable of words in the New Testament. It's the most untranslatable of words. Why? Because many Christians hold on to their own understanding of the word meek and don't dig deep into God's word to unpack what it really means. And we have to look at what Jesus' thoughts were. What did Jesus mean when he said meek. Where did Jesus get this word meek from? We have to understand his thoughts so we know what meek means. You might say, Brad, how do we know Jesus's thoughts on meek? Well, that's a great question. When Jesus mentions, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, he is quoting from Psalm chapter 37. I want you to turn in your Bible to Psalm chapter 37 because remember, Jesus when he quotes scripture, he does not have the New Testament in his hand. So when he quotes scripture, what is he using? He's using the Old Testament. The Old Testament was his Bible. That was his scripture. And so when he quotes and says, blessed are the meek, he gets it from Psalm chapter 37. And I want you to see what Psalm chapter 37 says. It says this, but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in the abundant peace. See, here's the word meek. Very similar language. The meek will inherit the land. So what does meek mean? Here's what it means. I put it this way in your notes. Meek means afflicted. Meek means afflicted. You might say, Brad, where do you get that from? Well, the Hebrew word for meek, which Jesus quoted, is anavim which means afflicted. And so in other words, Jesus is saying, blessed are the afflicted, for they shall inherit the earth. When we look at Psalm 37 as a whole, and when you read that chapter all together, and not just the one verse, you get a great picture of the afflicted. King David writes this psalm while he, to the Jews, to the Israelites, and he writes it while he's observing the world around him. 
And when he looks at the world around him, he sees that the wicked are succeeding. They're in power. They have everything. Everything seems to be going the way of the wicked. But when David looked around and saw God's people, he saw a people that were oppressed. He saw them afflicted. He saw them persecuted. He saw them suffering in want and in need. And he knew that the natural attitude of man would be, God, this isn't fair. And so he writes to those that are afflicted and says, don't worry about the wicked. You keep trusting God because the meek will inherit the land. Church, if we look around us, do we not see the same thing taking place in our society, in our world? Do we not see the wicked around us prospering? Do we not see that those who have little, if any, morals rise to the top of businesses and organizations, and those who have standards stay at the bottom? Do we not see women being abused while their abusers go on free? Do we not see women and children raped and nothing seems to happen? Do we not see sex traffickers continuing to use women and children and men for their purposes and nothing seems to change or to matter? Do we not see murder, violence, hatred, and, air, and anger go on without any consequences? Do we not see God's people suffering persecutions at the hand of the wicked? Church, if we are not careful, we can see all the suffering around us and become bitter and angry, and then that anger fills our hearts, and we get sinful thoughts and sinful actions, and then we cry out saying, God, you're not fair. The wicked are getting everything. And when you get to that place, your faith begins to fade. And you doubt God. You take your eyes off God, and everything becomes all about your afflictions. We must be reminded of what David said to God's people. Look at verse 1 and 2 of Psalm chapter 37. He says this, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. He says, fret not. The word for fret means this very hot in anger. Because when we endure suffering of injustice of all kinds, our natural response is to want to get angry and to get mad at those who are doing the injustice to us. And David says, don't be hot in anger. Understand. Look at what it's, look, they might seem to be in power right now, but they will fade. Their rule is temporary. They're going to be gone in a short time. Don't worry about them. It is with this context in mind that we find in verse 11 where it says, Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who are, in other words, blessed are those who are afflicted. Here's the second thing I put in my notes. I put it this way. Afflictions are the norm, not the exception for God's people. Afflictions are the norm, not the exception for God's people. That statement I just made does not sit well with many people in Christian circles. They don't like to hear that. How dare we say that God's people are going to experience suffering? There's a false view that says Christianity will experience, Christians will experience God's unending blessing on earth. And they believe that God, here's what God will do for you. He will elevate Christians to the top places in all the business world. He will make Christians rich. He will make Christians drive fancy cars. He will make Christians live in big houses. He will fill their lives with material possessions. Church, if that's the message you're looking to hear this morning, you are in the wrong place. Because we are here to teach God's word faithfully and with truth. If you are looking for Christians to take the world by strength, power, and might, you are in the wrong place. Because Jesus says, blessed are the afflicted. 
When you look at Scripture from the beginning to the end, you see over and over that God's people experience suffering of all kinds, whether it's at the hands of wicked people or if it's just suffering because of lack of need and not having things that they need to survive, that God's people are suffering everywhere. Listen, you don't believe me, listen to Jesus' own words. Jesus says this in John 15, 18 through 20. He says, if the world hates you, Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, expect persecutions because of your faith in Christ. Here's a question. If you're not being persecuted for your faith and the whole world loves you, what message are you sharing about your God? Because our God, the message that we proclaim, is foolishness to those who are perishing. They do not like it. They hate it. They can't stand it. They try to squash it out. They try to kill it out of us. Ever since, look at Jesus' example. He says this in Matthew 16, 24. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his what? Cross and follow me. Jesus said, if you expect to be my follower, you must be ready to die for your faith in me. Cross was the instrument of death. It's what Jesus died upon. And he said, you want to be my follower, expect to be persecuted. Expect people not to like the message you're going to share. We must be willing to follow Christ, even if it means our death. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy 3.12, he says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be what? All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's not a maybe. This is the norm for God's people. In all of Scripture, you see the suffering of God's people over and over. And I'm sure there's many of you here this morning that can share stories of how you were persecuted for your faith in Jesus Christ. I know I suffered persecution. My wife and I have lost friends because of our faith in Christ. They don't understand. Why don't you do the things that we do? Why do you quit going out to these places? Why do you quit doing these things? You guys are weird. You're ridiculous. And we've lost friends. And yeah, it it hurts and you suffer. But we trust God. We look to God. I I had a guy that came up to me the other week. And he said, he knows I'm a pastor, and he came and he said, if God is real, and God is all-powerful, and God is all-loving, right, Brad? And I said, yeah, I agree, amen. You're preaching my message. And he said, well, then here's the thing. I see women and children that are being raped, and God's not stopping it. You're God. It's not real. Your God is stupid, and you're stupid for believing in God. See, try to, try to reason with him through Scripture, try to give him my understanding. He didn't want it. He hated it. He said, you're stupid for believing in that. And, you see, the reality is our message is not one that the wicked like to hear. We face persecutions, but what do we do? We pray for them. Because I look at my life, and I, there was a time in my life where I was poor in spirit. I was a lost sinner who wanted nothing to do with God. I, people would talk about God, I don't care about that, I don't want to hear it. And so when I look at somebody that persecutes me, I have to look at them the way that, that God had looked at me in my life. That even though I was this wicked sinner that wanted nothing to do with them, God still extended his love and his grace to my life. 
And our response to the wickedness is not to be frustrated with their suffering, but is to pray for them and love them, like Jesus says later in the Sermon on the Mount. But we will face persecutions and suffering as God's children. If we are truly living as God's people, then we can expect suffering, whether it's at the hands of the wicked or suffering because we are in want or need. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, or in other words, blessed are the afflicted. So here's the second thing I put in my notes, the second question I had. How do God's people endure affliction? I admit, as I began to unpack this, I'm sitting there in my office day after day going, we have to suffer. That is not a, a, a comforting message that we want to hear. It's difficult to grasp. But we have to understand, remember, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is providing comfort to his disciples. He's saying, yeah, when you are suffering, there's going to be comfort. I'm here to comfort you through that suffering. So there is a way to endure under immense suffering. I looked at, I looked at eight passages in the Old Testament that had that Hebrew word for meek, anavim. And when I looked in there, four, there was amazing things that it has to say about what God does in the midst of our suffering. Four out of the eight times that it mentions our suffering and our afflictions, hear what it says about God. It says that God hears the cries of his afflicted. Understand that you are never alone in your suffering. Understand that God never turns his back on your suffering. Every cry, every tear, God hears the cries of his afflicted. Not only that, but here's what it says in the verses. He leads us. He teaches us. He strengthens us. He lifts us up. He delivers good news to us. He exacts justice on our behalf. He shows himself to us. He adorns us with salvation. He saves us in our suffering. You see, our God is always in the midst of our suffering, holding our hand and walking through the suffering with us. We just have to look to God in the midst of our suffering and trust him completely. In Psalm 37, David gives the key to enduring suffering. He, like, he highlights five ways that God's people will naturally endure the suffering. Because remember, Jesus is talking to the disciples. They're demonstrating these characteristics of being poor, of being mourning over their sin, and of being meek, enduring suffering. And he says that when it comes to suffering, here's what God's people do. Here's the first thing. I put it in your notes this way. Trust in God alone. It's what God's people do in the midst of their suffering. It starts with God. Trust God alone. Here's what it says in Psalm 37, 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. The only way we can endure suffering is to have trust in God. There are many who have no trust in God, and when suffering hits, they have no one to turn to. They have nowhere to go but to try to do whatever the world has to offer. But God's people in the midst of suffering know we have nowhere else to turn but to God. Because the world in the midst of our suffering doesn't make sense. There's confusion, there's misunderstanding, there's, there's all kinds of emotions that can get out of whack. And we realize as God's people, the only place we have to turn to make sense of anything is at the feet of God. And so God's people turn to him. For those of us in here that are God's children, Think of the, the, mo the, the times in your life where you experienced suffering. And how many of you, God's people, during your suffering, have found that in the midst of your suffering, the only person that could comfort you was God? We would have testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony. God's people turn to God. I had a, 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 a few years ago, I was teaching elementary at a at another school, and it was my last year teaching elementary, and I taught a fifth grade class, and um, I had this girl in my class, her name was Valentina, and when she came into my class, she was this little thing, she was uh, like so tiny, I thought like if the wind blew when we were at recess, she would fly away, and so, so small, and I remember she came in, and she was very shy, and she's like, 
Who is this skinny weirdo with the beardo guy teaching this class? He's doing these crazy things. And I remember just having to keep talking to her. And finally, she opened up, and the whole class loved her. She was the sweetest girl in the whole wide world. Uh, a few months after I left teaching, I got horrific news that she was murdered by her mom in a murder suicide. And I remember getting out of my bed, like, what? And I told Kelly, I'm like, look what I just found out. And I remember crying and being heartbroken. I remember thinking, God, how can, a tw- how can this happen to a 12-year-old innocent girl? Like, God, I don't understand why you would allow this to happen. Like, this is such a senseless act that doesn't make any sense. And what my wife and I, in our brokenness, we realized the only thing we could do was to fall at God's feet and say, God, I don't understand, but you do. God, I don't have all the answers, but you do. God's people turn to God in their suffering. It's natural to us because we don't see the whole picture like God does, right? We have finite minds. We only see this little piece that is before us. But God sees the whole picture. He sees how it all fits together and how his name will be glorified and how people will come to him through however heinous the suffering might be. And so our attitude is, God, I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand my suffering. I'm hurting. I trust you. You have all the answers, God. The only one I'm looking towards is you. It's the first attitude that God's people have. David says, not only do the people trust in God, the second part of that verse says, trust in the Lord and do good. God's people endure trusting, endure suffering by trusting, but not only that, they continue to do the work of God. Many people are willing to give up on God when suffering hits. But here David says, no, 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 no. In your suffering, trust God. You keep serving. You keep chasing your calling. You keep giving. You keep loving. You keep on living for God. Do good. Befriend faithfulness. And you will honor God in your suffering. Here's the second thing he says. Delight in God delight in God. God's people not only trust in God, they delight in God. And here's what he says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. We realize that in the midst of our suffering, our only satisfaction in life in that moment is God. That our delight is in him and him alone. The only place we get comfort is from God alone. And here's why we delight because we know that if we trust our own desires, our desires are all for wicked, sinful things to retaliate and get revenge. And we know when we delight in God, God gives us desires of our heart, desires that are righteous, desires that are pure, desires that are holy. Here's the third thing. God's people commit their way to God. Here's what it says in Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord, trust him, and he will act. When I looked at the Hebrew word for commit, the word literally means to roll. And so if you put that word there, roll their way to God. You might say, what does it mean to roll our afflictions to God? What it means is we recognize that our afflictions we can't bear. And so we say, hey God, I can't handle this, you need to handle it. God, I can't handle my relationship problems, so God, you need to handle it. God, I can't handle my financial problems. God, you need to handle it. God, I can't handle all this pain and suffering of the loss of a loved one. God, you need to handle it. God, my health problems are too big for me. I'm not capable. God, I roll it to you. It's what it means for God's people to commit their way to God. It's to roll it to him, to recognize that he is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. He is more than capable of bearing our burdens. And so we roll our way to him. Here's the next thing David says. Not only do God's people commit their way to him, they wait for God. Psalm 37.7 says this. 
Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil desires. The mark of God's people realized that God, right? Romans 8, 28, for all things work together for good, right? And so God's people in the midst of their suffering understand that we are going to wait for God to work. We're not going to try to make hasty decisions and try to get our own way out of suffering and try to come up with our strategies and our ideas so that we don't suffer anymore. No, we don't do that. We wait on God because we know that one day God's going to act. And when God acts, we're going to see how God has worked everything together. And we know, the verse before that even says that, uh, commit your way to the Lord, and it says, and he will act. God will act on our behalf. He will come to us in the midst of our suffering. But see, the world doesn't respond that way to suffering. When the world encounters suffering, they say, you know what, I'm going to solve it in my own power, my own strength, and God wouldn't allow this suffering to happen to me, so I'm going to run from God. I know that's what I did before I became one of God's children. When my dad died, I said, okay, God, if you were all loving and you were all good, then you wouldn't have allowed my dad to die. My dad died, therefore you're not good and loving. I'm going to run from you as far as I can. It's like, you thought I was bad? Wait till you see me now. It's the attitude that people have that aren't God's children. But now after I've been saved, redeemed, sanctified, when I go through suffering, I wait. I allow God to to exact his justice. I allow God to handle the suffering that's in my life. Here's the next thing he says. The last thing he says is refrain from anger. Psalm 37, 8 and 11, he says this. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there but the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. You might say, that was a mouthful. What does all that mean? Here's the way I put it in my notes. God's people refrain from all retaliation, revenge, anger, and bitterness because of the suffering they are experiencing. God's people are always focused on the future and not focused on the present circumstances. For we know the wicked might seem to prosper now, but their lives are temporary and their judgment is eternal. And so when we are persecuted for our faith, we do not respond in anger. It's a great man of the Bible, Moses. I'm sure a lot of you in here have heard of him. Strong leader of Israel. And there's a story in the Bible where Miriam and Aaron come up to Moses and they chastise him. They go after him and say, you married a woman that's not a Jew. Give him a hard time. Right after, the Bible says that Moses was a very meek man, more than all the people who were on the face of the earth. And you know what Moses said back to them? Nothing. He did not defend himself. He did not feel the need to say, no, 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 it's not right for you to accuse me. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know I'm God's servant? How dare you? Didn't say it. He said nothing. You know what happened? The Lord spoke to all of them. And the Lord declared, Moses is my servant. God spoke and fought on behalf of Moses. Moses was meek in the midst of his suffering. He trusted God, refrained from anger, and God acted. But the greatest example of meek, the afflicted, is no other than Jesus Christ. Jesus is described as the suffering servant. Here's what it says in 1 Peter 2, 21 through 24. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Catch this, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And his persecutions and his sufferings, he not one time responded back with anger or retaliation. He could have turned all of them into sheep. And they pulled his beard and spit on him. He could have obliterated them right then and there. But he remembered that his mission on earth was to be obedient to the Father, even to the point of death. And he sets the example for us in suffering that we are obedient, that we refrain from anger. When others speak falsely about us, we don't retaliate and do the same, that we allow God to fight on our behalf. Here's the last thing. So what's the reward for the meek? Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So the meek will inherit the earth. I remember when I first thought about it, I said, why does Jesus say the reward for the meek is that they inherit the earth? Here's what, how it makes sense to me now. Those as God's people have little, have nothing, because we give up everything to have Christ, right? And so those of God's people are not ruling the world now. We're in want, we're oppressed, we're persecuted. The wicked are prospering. The wicked have the success that society thinks you need to have. But God's people have nothing. And so when Jesus says, blessed are the afflicted, catch this, here's the reward, because one day you will inherit the earth and you will have everything. So what does it mean to inherit the earth? 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we endure with Christ, we will also reign with him. In Hebrews 11.35, to inherit the earth means we must look forward to the resurrection. Because when we inherit the earth, we reign with Christ. And look at what Hebrews 11.35 says. These are men and women of God who suffered persecution, who lived a life of suffering. And here's what it says. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing, catch this, they refused to accept release. Why would they do that? So that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, and catch this, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. These faithful men and women gave up the world's gains so that they could obtain the resurrection, that one day they would rise again and return with Christ. And when Christ created the new heaven and the new earth, they would reign with Christ forever. Sometimes we get the idea that, uh, that life is all about heaven and that we're going to sit on a cloud, we're going to play a harp in our diaper. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says that we will resurrect and we will reign with Christ on earth. That that is something to look forward to. That is our hope. That's what Paul looked forward to. That's why he says he considers everything in this world rubbish, garbage as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. Because he knew one day he would rise again. That the best is yet to come. Hebrews 12, 1 through 2 says this. When we look at the examples of these faithful men and women of God. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses... Let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the, of the throne of God. We endure suffering by looking to Jesus at all times. Look to him for your strength. 
Look to him for your joy. Look to him for your comfort. Look to him for your resurrection. And when you do, you will have the same attitude as Paul. And catch this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body of death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. Verse 17 says this, For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul's attitude was there was nothing that could be done to him to destroy his faith in Jesus Christ because he knew the promise that Jesus said that one day you will reign and live with me forever, that my people will inherit the earth, not the wicked. So who cares if you suffer in this life because it's temporary. You're looking at 70 years, 75 on this earth. Think of eternity when you have everything in me. That's what we look forward to in our suffering. So we look at our suffering and say, man, is it worth it? Because my best is not right now. My best is yet to come. And I want to rise with Christ. I want to reign with Christ. I want to inherit the earth and be with him in eternity forever. So here's a walkaway point that I leave with. I said it this way to sum it up. The meek are those who serve God's purposes in the face of all suffering. Your suffering is never an excuse to give up seeking to live God's purposes for your life. In your suffering, you say, God, I trust you. I'm following you no matter what. Bow your hearts with me this morning. Jesus offers comforting words this morning because there's many of us that are going through all kinds of suffering that we never share with anyone The suffering that we might be enduring that we keep to ourselves. But hear Jesus' words this morning to you, to those that are afflicted. You will inherit the earth. What is wrong will be made right. That God is working and acting in your life. And our sole responsibility is to say, God, I don't understand. God, it's confusing. God, it's hard. God, it's hurting. But I still choose to serve you. That could be your attitude. What a testimony you will be to this world and to those around you. Because the world doesn't get why Christians can face persecution and choose a life of pain. They say, how can you guys do that? They could take your life. They could take your stuff. And we say we do it because of the hope we have in Christ that even if they kill us, we will be present with our Savior, Jesus Christ. That Jesus set the example that he was persecuted, he was put to death, and we are willing to go to death to follow our Savior. So don't think if you beat me, I'm quitting. Don't think if you yell hateful words at me that I'm walking away. That will not stop me. God's people rise over and over and over again in the midst of persecution because God's word is true, God is faithful, and the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. So let the persecutions come. 
Let you suffer for your faith in Jesus Christ because God is your vindicator. He's your savior. He's your redeemer. He's your king that will not be stopped by anything man can do. He is the all victorious king. It's our God. Trust him this morning. Father God, we come to you thanking you for your word. God, your word speaks the truth. We know that this world offers us suffering. And God, you know that there are many in this room that are suffering this morning. You know exactly where their heart is crying and where it's broken. But we remember your mission is to bring good news to the poor, to comfort those who mourn, and to give us the promise that we will inherit the earth by being obedient to you. God, I pray for all of us that each day we would look at this world as temporary and long for the day that we see you face to face and reign with you forevermore. We love you. It's in your mighty name we pray. Amen.